Welcome to Sex Ed with DB. I'm your host, DB. Let's get into it. Welcome back to the podcast. If you love and support the work that we do, consider joining my crew on Patreon to win amazing prizes like our adorable merch, exclusive behind the scenes content, and incredible sex toys. Go to patreon.com slash sexedwithdb to join my crew. Get discounts at all of your favorite sex toy shops at sexedwithdb.com. And follow us on Insta at sexedwithdbpodcast and on TikTok at sexedwithdb. If you want to partner with us, email us at sexedwithdb at gmail.com. Ever wish there was a Netflix of sexual wellness and intimacy? Lucky for you, there is. Meet Beducated. Beducated's online course platform has easy to follow video, audio, and written guides that provide techniques and information to level up your love life. They have so many courses on all things sex and intimacy, but some of my faves are the female orgasm course, cunnilingus course, and the squirting course. Join Beducated from just $7.99 per month with a 24-hour free trial using my coupon code, sexed at beducated.com. If you've been a longtime fan of Sex Ed with DB, you've definitely heard of Clona Willy. But if you're new here, let me fill you in. Clona Willy makes incredible DIY molding kits that allow anyone to make an exact replica of any penis or vulva into a high quality, 100% body safe sex toy. And there are so many fun colors to choose from. Use promo code SEXEDWITHDB for 20% off at clonawilly.com. And follow them on Instagram at Clona Willy Kit. We talk a lot about sex ed, but when we're shopping for products to support our sexual wellness, exploration, and expression, we head to the experts at Lion's Den. Lion's Den is an adult retailer with 46 locations nationwide and hundreds of your favorite brands. They have everything you need to explore and express your sexual side. Right now, you can use code SEXEDWITHDB for 15% off your purchase in-store and online. Follow them on social media at Lion's Den Adult on IG and TikTok for exclusive offers, deals, and giveaways. Hey everybody, just here to give you a little bit of a warning that in this episode we will be discussing suicide. So if that is challenging for you, feel free to skip to minute 1025 and skip from 4340 to 4740 or skip this episode altogether. Thanks so much for listening. Courtney, hello. Welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. So excited that you're here. I have seen you in a couple of different articles and on the interwebs. And I'm very, very excited to talk to you today about herpes and STIs. And I can't wait to get into our conversation. It's going to be the best. Yeah. um, I love having this conversation, um, especially given how much depth it goes into uh, to show people that it's so much more than just about herpes or STIs. But I'm going to let you do the interview because I I talk. I really, really talk. (laughs) Well, I'm glad to have you. You're you're here to talk. So that's excellent. But please go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, Tell us about your your advocacy, and your podcast, which is called Something Positive for Positive People, aka SPFPP. Yeah. So in 2017, Something Positive for Positive People began as a suicide prevention resource for people who are struggling most with herpes stigma. And I want to preface this um everything that I speak to moving forward, just with that, I believe most people who are living with herpes are okay or at an okay place with it. And so we don't hear from them. We don't hear from the experts, if you will, on living with herpes stigma because they're living with herpes stigma and it's not really impacting them. So for the people who are in their most extreme uh, dark places about it to the point of suicide ideation, what this began as was me just finding people who could offer their experiences so that people who didn't have any sort of a roadmap to navigate their diagnosis, dating, disclosure, had something in order to reference um, to navigate the stigma. 
going from the first interview to the second led to there being a lot more as I continue to share within the herpes support groups and communities that I'm part of. I have herpes. I've had herpes uh, genital HSV2 for nine years now. And in 2017, that was when I first stumbled into these communities. And after having seen that there were people who were struggling as much as they were, the best thing that was in my realm of perspective to do was to bring these experiences to the people who needed them most. And then over time, that began to evolve into what became a podcast called Something Positive for Positive People. In 2019, I registered for nonprofit 501c3 status in order to be able to raise money to pay for people to get therapy. In 2020, 2021, we were able to get 40-ish people enrolled into therapy. And those 40-ish people gave me a lot of useful insights for how to heal, if you will, uh, and what that process looks like. What I found to be interesting, just a couple of things, was uh, one, that people who reached out to me for therapy already had a therapist and they didn't want to tell their therapist that they had herpes. So I thought that was kind of strange and something that's worth exploring uh, stigma in the mental health space. Another thing that stood out was how useful the podcast itself was. It wasn't necessarily the, the therapy, if you will, that people really found the support and healing from. It was being able to have a resource that allowed for them to hear two or more people intelligently and confidently talk about what it meant to live with the herpes virus. That was something that was really, really supportive to them. So in reflecting on all of the input that people gave from going through their exit interviews, what I came to was that um, we can recommend therapists who are sex positive, who have experiences in working with people navigating stigma, but ultimately the podcast is what the resource is. So now the focus has been more getting back to the core of something positive for positive people which is suicide prevention. And it just so happens to extend into uh, talking about herpes, talking about sexual health communication, as well as that interconnectedness of sexual health and mental health. Uh, so through connecting with people there, I hope to be able to bring this to light that, you know, when we look at it from a suicide prevention resource or from a suicide prevention angle, it really begins where sex education starts and then when a diagnosis happens. Everything in between there is stigma because we're not prepared for dealing with a diagnosis and we're not prepared to seek out resources in the event that we take all of the preventive measures and then they happen to let us down or fail, if you will. So being able to prepare youth in a way that allows for them to be able to seek support and resources in the event that something does go wrong, it is directly suicide prevention, um, uh, is suicide prevention. And that's why I'm really excited to be able to talk with you because you are offering that. Um, we, we, we're talking about sex education here and uh, just this angle, while, yeah, it might be extreme to say suicide prevention, but I've done surveys and uh, polls for the Something Positive for Positive People audience. And again, these are people who are looking for the resources. That means that these are the people who are, you know, in pretty bad places. So um, the most recent survey that I did, just to give you an idea, reflected uh, the experiences of 1,149 people who were living with herpes. And of that, 3% of people attempted suicide. And this is an attempt. This isn't suicide ideation. The first survey that I did, it capped at 100 people, but uh, 6% of that 100 had attempted suicide and 48%, I believe, had suicide ideation. So being able to speak to these things in a way that offers like education and resources, um, I think that we can really see just how interconnected sexual health and mental health are. And I even argue that sexual health is mental health. Uh, I'll pause there because I keep 
I keep going. I was like, oh, should I should I jump? No, this is this is really, really good stuff. I think that I didn't quite realize, I think, that something positive for positive people started as suicide prevention and then became maybe other. And then also you kind of came back to your original goal. And not only that, but you're really intertwining this idea, as you said, of sexual health and mental health and that being long-term suicide prevention in order to destigmatize STIs, to get people the care and the empowerment and the support that they need to live happy and healthy sexual lives. And so I'm totally right there with you. Moving a little bit along and moving to maybe a little bit of the lighter stuff. You talked briefly about sex ed, but let's back up. You you mentioned a little bit, maybe you're a journalist in the space. I want to know like who Courtney is, where'd you grow up? What was your sex ed like? Like, tell me a little bit more about your story because often sex ed in the US, right, like leans heavily into stigmatization of STIs. And I'm wondering in your sex ed experience, did you have that experience? And if you did, like, how did it affect your thinking about SDIs? Um, as I was listening to your podcast with um, Reverend Pleasure, I thought about my first exposure to sex ed. And I can't remember what came first between uh, hearing about sex from friends or if it was at home watching the first porn on VHS that I actually saw or if it came from school. Uh, I remember early on that like my, my household was very like pro don't get pregnant, don't get anybody pregnant. It wasn't really about STIs or um, any sort of at, at that point in time, STD was the word that was used. It was about pregnancy. My mom had me at a young age. Uh, she was pregnant with me at 17. And the experience that she had navigating a teen pregnancy, still living at home, she didn't want that for me, nor did my grandfather, my grandmother want that for me. So they really drove home not to get anyone pregnant. All right. And I think that the very first exposure uh, to what sex was beyond pregnancy might have been that VHS tape. It was an interracial threesome, which speaks highly to like where I'm at in my own sexuality right now. Interesting. Yeah, very. Yeah. So um, that was my very first. I remember the tape. I remember what the people looked like. <laughs> and this was at uh, how old would I have been? I was under 12 for sure. And like, that was my first experience. Like, I remember like not wanting to masturbate because I don't know what it was. I always felt like somebody was watching me. I don't know how arrogant you have to be to think that someone is always watching you. And maybe this had something to do with religion. God can see you, you know? Right. And so I remember like not wanting to masturbate. I don't think I even masturbated officially until uh, I might have been 14. I was in middle school. And I remember it was like, it was like a, a shotgun. It was, boom and I came and I was like yo what is this and I didn't <laughs> oh, want to be made fun wow. of right <laughs> I never and thinking that someone was always watching I was like oh my god what if my friends found out that I'm masturbating instead of having sex because that was like the thing. oh like, that was like embarrassing make, comparatively yeah it was like we'd make fun of people who can't get laid or oh you haven't had sex yet sure. you're you're late to the party and so what i would do was and this is embarrassing but i mean for the sake of sex education this is a thing that needs to be discussed if you don't give people like a roadmap of where to go and the direction to go into then they'll kind of just go away from things in a way that could be more dangerous so um i used to have these i'll use like paper towel rolls and put like baby oil gel in them or Vaseline or something. And that was how I masturbate because I wasn't masturbating because I wasn't doing it with my hand. But I was like oh. fucking these paper towel rolls, you know? And then when they were done, I was done. And like, I put toilet paper at the end of it. So when I came, I just fold it up and throw it away. And it was sure. funny because like, it, I was collecting fucking paper towel rolls. I don't think I've ever told anybody this story, but I was thinking about oh it here God, in the podcast. So, I'm so privileged and honored. Oh, yeah. Thank so you for was, sharing. Yeah, for sure. And it's so funny now. Like, I can't stop laughing when, I, when it crossed my mind. I was like, am I going to tell this story? Yes. So, um, 
Like, I remember if the paper towel rolls were like half full or full all the way, like I'd get in there and take them out and just leave them. My mom be like, where's the inside of the paper towel? Don't worry about it. Leave me alone. It ran away. I have no idea. I've never seen it. Never heard of it. I would creep out and then, because like the toilet paper rolls were, oh, dude, this sounds bad. The toilet paper rolls weren't big enough, but uh, like I would, I didn't want to make a mess. Like I didn't want to touch it, right, at all. So I would, uh, I'd like hide it and throw it out in the big trash can and keep them from ever realizing what was actually going on. <laughs> with these toilet paper and paper towel rolls oh my god they like probably had some idea about like something was happening but maybe not exactly no they you kept it from them they had no clue no idea i was a ninja with this um, oh wow and then like if i ever would have gotten caught like if somebody would have walked down i'd have just like thrown it in my shorts and my hands would have been dry because everything's inside the paper towel roll so it was a genius i had a genius it's plan kind of like the original f- flashlight in a sense that's it that's where the idea came from <laughs> <laughs> that's but so funny those were some of my earlier experiences and um i think that it took I became comfortable with the idea of sex after learning that my friends were having sex and no one was getting pregnant. And then I would hear at school, if you have sex before marriage or if you have sex, then you're going to get an SCI. SCI stink, they hurt, and you'll know if someone has one. That's what messaging was brought up to me. And so that narrative, along with my friend saying that they were having sex and they weren't getting anybody pregnant and then watching porn where people are having sex without condoms. So obviously they don't have any STIs. This was very conflicting messaging for me. So after, you know, taking a chance and doing what my friends were doing, which was having sex, it was like, oh, no one got pregnant. No one got an STI. This sex thing's not bad and it is actually pretty fun. So it just like I feel maybe even made me like super hungry for it at that age. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like I'm adolescence, being a teenager, like, yeah, hormones are raging. That's like all that's on your mind. But all that was on my mind, let me say that I don't want to speak for other people's experiences, but That was kind of, uh, I feel as if that was influenced by the attempt to keep me from being sexual or exploring my sexuality. Like how much time did I spend and how much, you know, resources were wasted on me sneaking around baby oil gel, Vaseline and paper towel rolls. I think that the baby oil gel disappearing was probably more of an issue than the paper towel rolls going away. (laughs) This is so funny to think about. (laughs) but yeah i mean you were a kid right like there there are so many things that kids do that make it seem like it's so wild and so weird and so kooky and crazy but the reality is is that many kids most kids masturbate in some form using whatever tools they can find around the house especially because parents at least of my, I'm 29 of my parents' generation, and it also really depends on culture and race and ethnicity and where you grew up. And there are so many factors that go into what your parents are comfortable talking to you about. And I don't think it was normal at all for our parents, my parents' generation, to sit you down and say, hey, this is what feels good in your body, and here are appropriate ways to touch yourself, and here's how to be safe, and here's how to be private in terms of doing it in your bedroom, you know? And so I think that to us, we have these like really deep-seated shame, like shameful stories about how we masturbated and how we engaged with sex. And the reality is, is it's totally normal in most cases. And I think That brings me to the next topic, which is herpes, because that's also normal and it's very common. And so I have a couple of stats that I want to share with our listeners. According to John Hopkins Medicine, 50, 50 to 80, 80% of American adults have oral herpes, which is typically herpes simplex virus 1, HSV1 which literally are cold sores or blisters in or around the mouth, okay? And genital herpes, that's typically HSV2, affects around one out of every six people in the U.S. aged 14 to 49. So 
like sharing those stats, first of all, with herpes one, um, I have herpes one. <laughs> I think that I've talked about that on the podcast before. And I get a sore in my mouth, you know, once a month in the same spot. I personally take antivirals every day to suppress the sores. Um, and it's an inconvenience and it's manageable. And just like many other people who are living with chronic conditions or other ways that they experience pain, you know, whether that, whether that be emotionally, mentally, mentally, physically, um, I think that it's, it's common. And I really wanted to take the space and a moment to say that before I hear about your experience with herpes and how you advocate to destigmatize and normalize the diagnosis for others. Um, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate yeah. that you had statistics because I shy away from them completely. I more so highlight the experiences of people and their experiences navigating stigma. Um, I want to say I didn't realize this until therapy that my experience with my herpes diagnosis was really a physical representation of something that had been happening with me emotionally or mentally even. Um, and that was like this avoidance of rejection. Like if you look at me now, I have this platform, this social media, this organization, this podcast, all of that. And it's like a way of avoiding rejection, if you will. To be able to say, like, if you Google Courtney Brain, you will always see herpes stuff. So therefore, no one can reject me for having herpes because this is out there. So I process this. Sorry, I have from to interrupt myself. you because it's kind of like that moment in Eight Mile where Eminem at the end is just like, I do live in a trailer with my mom. And he's like, yes, fuck you. And that's basically like if I tell everyone my secrets, then they have nothing on me. Yeah. And that's my favorite movie too, by the way. So there's oh, a connection really? there. I'm glad you referenced okay. that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think I can quote, I can probably quote it for at the very least, like the the last rap battle, but uh, I, we're, we're drifting. We're Fantastic. Drifting. Another time, um, another episode. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I put it out there and it's out there. I don't have to worry about someone rejecting me for my positive herpes status because everyone knows and therefore no one should be able to slip through the cracks about it. Right. So if anybody shoots their shot or anything like that, like it's it's there and I'm not hiding it anymore for myself. So the energy that would normally have to go into hiding it can be poured into the organization. So I come from a place of a lot of people call me brave or they'd say, oh, you're so courageous. And honestly, that's not what it is. It's privilege. I come from a place of privilege where my income is not directly impacted by being open about my herpes status. I don't have to worry about any sort of stigmatization in the workplace. Um, I worked with a friend and have been self-employed for the entirety of my de decision to be open about um, having herpes. And when this podcast started, when the organization started, I was already open about it. Um, and I was when this all started, I was already working for myself and didn't have to worry about that. And I felt very supported by my family, friends and the people around me. Um, I didn't have any real encounters with stigma outside of my dating life just because the people that I would disclose to weren't OK with it. And that's perfectly fine because I might have been the first person who told them I have herpes. And I have to sort of have grace with that because I have to let them have their reaction to it. Their reaction may not be the best <laughs> to me, but it's their reaction that they're having. And I've grown to understand and really be able to receive that from other people just under the um, just just knowing that I might be the first person who's telling you this. So. It hasn't always been like this. Um, I, Like I said, I had herpes for nine years now. The first four years were very, I was small, I was hiding, and I was avoiding pursuing new partners to date. And it was all because I didn't want to have to tell them this. And I never wanted to really sit with what that meant why it hurts so much to say to someone else, I have herpes, and think about what type of reaction I would expect to receive and why would I expect that? And it was through the course of 
looking back on my experience before something positive for positive people, speaking to so many people who have an uh, STI diagnosis, that I recognize how interconnected our identity is with our sexuality. And to receive an STI diagnosis, it's just like something comes in and just completely shatters your idea of who you think you are. So it mm-hmm. hit me and it hit so many other people that I speak with in that way. And now we're having to put these shattered pieces of ourselves back together in a new way. And we can do so in a way where it's like we're scooping up the glass and we're just trying to hurry up and get it together and we're going to cut our hands and it's just going to be a pile of grossness or we can take our time and examine these pieces of ourselves and what does sex mean? Am I even heterosexual? Am I having the kind of pleasure that I should be having? What does it mean to have an STI? What am I afraid of? How do how is my relationship to other people, relationships, uh, to rejection? And you can begin to gently put those pieces back together for yourself and discard what doesn't serve you anymore. And you have to just be willing to examine that, look at it, and then you're going to go forward and have such a more healthy experience in navigating your sexuality. Do you ever look at yourself in the mirror and think, damn, my part is fine art? Well, Clona Willie definitely thinks so. Made in Portland, Oregon, Clona Willie makes for the most personalized sex toy on the planet and Clona Pussy makes for the most unique memento. Their mission is to create unique, affordable, and high-quality products that will not only last over the years, but provide their customers with a fun and memorable experience. Use promo code SEXEDWITHDB for 20% off at clonawilly.com. Close your eyes and think of your ideal sex toy. No matter what you like, you'll find it at Fun Factory. A few things Fun Factory's toys all have in common. They're 100% body safe so your mind is free to focus on fun. They include sex educator design games to get you going, and they're made in Germany, meaning they're long lasting. You get more O's from your toy when it stays in your nightstand and out of the landfill. Follow Fun Factory on IG at Fun Factory USA and use code SEXED with DB for 15% off your new favorite German vibe. That's really beautiful, and I can imagine that you are very good at leading group and individual sessions with people and just kind of like hearing them and. It is very much the kind of thing where the more you look inward and figure out like what is so devastating about this besides, of course, you know, well, not besides, including, I guess, the fact that there are so many cultural norms around herpes specifically and STIs. There are so many scripts that we, you know, ascribe to or prescribe to, I don't know, scribe, whatever that we listen to. Um, In movies and TV shows about herpes, herpes is always the butt of the joke. And it just, it feels very silly to me that we're not beyond that, given that so many people have it and so many people live with it and manage it. And so I think that's a very unfortunate piece about this whole thing, but really powerful to use a diagnosis as an opportunity to learn more about yourself and what you want out of relationships and what you want out of sex and pleasure in your life. Yeah, I really try and emphasize this identity validation piece, uh, how healing that is. Because a person who receives a diagnosis, again, they're attached to their sexuality and they kind of need this reminder of who they were a second before they had any inkling that maybe they have an SCI. And the only people who can do that are our family, friends, people who've known us. And these are the people we are so afraid of finding out Mm -hmm. about this thing about us. But they're the only people who can reassure us, who can reaffirm us. And I hear from people almost daily who are newly diagnosed or who've been struggling for a while and finally got the courage to speak out or reach out to me. And that's what it comes down to. Like, I'll hear people, I'll hold space for them. But ultimately, all I can do is get you to a point where you feel comfortable going to someone who knows you, who can reaffirm that you are who you were before we were in contact with each other. I could scroll Mm -hmm. through somebody's Instagram and get an idea, like, based on their interests. But that's it. Like, I am only serving as the voice that is probably in your own head as a whisper that's just like a little bit louder and saying, hey, 
tell someone like you're no different than who you were however long ago like have your mm-hmm. identity validated please yes uh so so powerful and really really important especially as you said when we have friends and family who would see us exactly the same and would completely tell us we're amazing and we are loved and there is nothing different about us um moving on to some myth busting um number 1 we have we have four myths here that I want to that I want to bust and I'm just curious with each of these myths if you have any comments or any things that come up for you when I say them um because I think they're really important myths to dispel so myth number 1 if you have herpes you'll definitely have symptoms which is false many people do not get symptoms ever or they can get symptoms way later. Not sure if you have any any comments about this. Yes, adding to that, a lot of people will unknowingly be tested for herpes or not know that they haven't been tested for herpes and then receive a diagnosis. So um, while the CDC doesn't recommend herpes testing without any physical symptoms, people are receiving a diagnosis who've never had symptoms and now having to figure out how to navigate this. There's this anticipation for symptoms and outbreaks, wondering if and how and when to disclose, what to disclose. Do I say, hey, I tested positive but never had symptoms? Do I say anything at all? Should I even have this information? And the more we dig for information, the more that we see just how inconsistent it all is. Mm. But yes, to, to just not drift off too far, you are absolutely right in that um, you you can go without having any symptoms at all. Totally. Yeah. And when you say, I just want to be clear for the audience, like there is a blood test that you can do at the doctor with a provider for herpes. But what Courtney is like saying, at least is what I think you're saying, is like those tests are not accurate unless you have a physical sore to like swab. And this is kind of actually um, myth number three, but let's just jump to that and we'll go back to, no, 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 this is great. And we'll go back to myth two, but myth three is you can tell if you have herpes by looking at a sore, which is false. The only way to really test for herpes is if you have an active sore or outbreak and you get it swabbed by a medical professional for testing. And so that's kind of closing the loop on this whole testing thing is that, you know, you can't tell by a blood test because it's not consistent and you can't tell just by looking at it. You really have to, unfortunately with herpes, have some sort of outbreak or a sore in order to get a test to see, oh, yes, this is positive for herpes one or herpes two. And just while we're while we're at it, I just want to be clear when I said typically herpes one is in the mouth or oral and typically herpes two is genital, that isn't necessarily true for all people. People can have herpes two, which again is typically genital herpes in their mouth. And the same thing for herpes one, it can happen uh, in your genitals. So I just kind of want to be clear about like, what what is this whole testing thing? When can you do it? And where can you find herpes? I hope that, that you agree with all of those things that I just said. That is satisfactory. Yes. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> okay, great. Um, let's go back to myth number two, because this is a super important one, which is without an outbreak, you can't transmit herpes. This is false. You can, in fact, shed the virus even if you do not have an outbreak. So all that is to say not to spread more stigma, but just to have the facts and just to understand that if you are about to get a sore within the next couple of days or if you already had a sore, but it, you know that was a couple of days ago, you can still what doctors and professionals call shed the virus. And that means that when you're in that shedding period, a partner who has genital to genital or mouth to genital or mouth to mouth contact can still tran- that can that can be transmitted to that partner. Yes, and just to add to that, because I like to add to things, um, there 
it's also a possibility that you may be someone who is positive for herpes and have a partner who is not positive, who just doesn't test positive. They may right. not test positive. They may not um, develop any symptoms at all. And there are plenty of people who have these ongoing kind of relationships, me included, where like I am just really mindful of my body. And something that we don't see spoken to in regards to HSV, the herpes simplex virus, is that communication plays such a major role in it. You touched on, right. you know, a few days before an outbreak may happen, you may feel a tingling sensation or potential symptoms. You know when you're going to have your outbreak orally. And so I imagine that you would, you know, refrain from uh, any activity that could potentially pass it on to a partner. Those are the highest risk points. So knowing and being able to have that clear, open communication with your body, with your partner, uh, these are things that also help minimize the risk of transmission. Completely, completely agree. This is incredibly important to talk about because it really depends on how you want to discuss this with your partner. If you're with somebody and they know that you have herpes, whether that be oral and or genital, and they're okay with that risk, then that is up to you two. That is completely up to you two to decide. And if this is someone who you're like, oh, I'm going to like marry them and we're going to have kids and we've been together for a really long time and we've talked about all the possibilities of these things, that's fantastic. If you are that way and you decide you want to be a little safer and maybe you want to use condoms when you have sex or discuss, you know, what are the precautions that you could put in place so that y'all are being as safe as possible, that's also great. It's really, really, as Courtney said, I feel up to the people in the relationship to decide what their comfort level is. And this is perfect because it goes to our fourth myth, which is, this is completely a myth. If you have herpes, you can't have a normal sex life, right? This is false. Plenty of people have herpes and have healthy, active sex lives with a partner or partners and with themselves. And once again, it is manageable. Um, anything you want to add or any more myths that you want to talk about? I was going to say, once you have herpes, like you, who wants a normal sex life? You know, like, what does that even look like? Do I know right. that before my diagnosis, I was having, I guess, quote, normal sex and that normal sex was not near as communicative as it is now. And I believe that the communication that occurs now, because I have to, you know, more so vet partners to see if there's someone who is going to be receptive to me disclosing, I'm finding myself in much more high quality interactions with partners. And then we're also talking about things that we like, like what we enjoy, how does pleasure uh, how do we experience pleasure in our bodies? What does sex look like to us? And this makes for a much more communicative sex life. I do not want to go back to the normal sex that I was having before at all. Totally. And it's because of the communication that has to occur now that I have my herpes diagnosis. Because before I didn't have a reason to talk about STIs because I learned that if people had an STI, they probably wouldn't want to have sex because it hurt, it stank, or you could see symptoms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an excellent point. It like is a blessing in disguise in like yeah. some ways of like being able to use your experiences as an opportunity to communicate in the best way possible. And if you are someone who's listening who has herpes and feel rejected by people who you've gone to and said, hey, I have herpes and I really like you and would really like to explore sexually and their response is anything but, hey, thank you for telling me. I want to think about it, you know, then they don't deserve you. Like they don't deserve to be with someone who is as communicative and as open and, and positive uh, no pun intended, <laughs> herpes positive. Um, but you know what I mean? Like, I just feel like it kind of weeds out the assholes who you don't want to be dating anyway. Yeah. And I'll always say this, like people have a right to not want herpes. Like I have herpes and I don't want it. Right. Right. Um, but hopefully the kind of person that you're vetting and disclosing to isn't going to be a jerk 
to you about right. it. And I think that we now having to have this kind of dialogue, our screening process has changed a little bit because it can be so draining to have this conversation over and over and over and over again to have it not really go in the direction of where we would like for it to go. So we start to screen people in that way. Like, are these people, is this person someone who aligns with the kind of relationship that I want to have, yes or no. And then we make the decision from there. There is a um, podcast episode I've done with Dr. Evelyn Dacker, who is a sex med doc on Instagram. Uh, it's called the Star Talk, and this is essentially a framework for negotiating um relationships. So the first S is for STI status, the T is for turn-ons, A avoids, R is for relationship intention, and the second S is for safety. So being able to make the conversation about disclosing your herpes status, something that is far more inclusive to the entirety of the relationship. Like you can even start with, hey, what do you want? And if I want short-term, you want long-term, we can decide from there whether we want to take this to the next step and what that's going to look like. And then you can go into the entirety of this conversation so that you can have a much more pleasant conversation. But that is a solid communications model for disclosing your herpes status if that's something that you're looking for. Super helpful. Yeah. Thank you so much. We have a couple more questions here. This has been a really, really awesome interview. So thanks again for coming on. But Back to STI stigma, because that is a big thing that you're fighting in your organization and through your podcast and chatting with people. Like, why is it important to fight STI stigma? And tell me a little bit about maybe like one of your experiences chatting with someone on your podcast who has herpes and their experience maybe having these conversations, coming to terms with their diagnosis, um, obviously don't need to name names because it's it should be anonymous, but you know, um, you know, with their figuring that out with themselves and with their own sexual and romantic partners. I wouldn't be able to find a lot of the podcast guests if I tried because everyone uses like a different first name just to protect their anonymity. So I have to like hurry up and remind them, hey, your podcast episode's out and I might sure. be wrong. So that's, <laughs> yeah, we don't have to worry about anybody being outed here. Um, okay, great. As far as combating stigma, I see a lot of people saying, you know, this needs to happen, that needs to happen, this needs to be done in reference to dissolving stigma. But I believe like we need to, do that within ourselves. Like it's a matter of checking any of your own stigma. How do you as a person respond to herpes jokes? How do you as a person respond when you see a flyer that says we want to eradicate all STDs and have an understanding that we all know someone who's living with a chronic STI. We just may not know it because we're not demonstrating ourselves to be a safe enough space for them to confide in us in that way. It was after I started to open up about my own status that I saw other people who I would have never known who were close to me also talk about having had STIs, herpes themselves, or even dating and knowing other people who also have it. So I put myself in position to demonstrate allyship and support for these people. And I hope that me living as an example of that for other people who may find themselves being disclosed to, whether it be romantically or just, um, or, or platonically, I didn't mean to say just, Ugh, I hate that I do that. Like when people say just friends, That's it okay. really bothers me because it like devalues the friendship. But anyway. Oh, uh, that's important. I, I like that you said that. Thank you. Uh, I want to inspire allyship. And that's what I'm hoping that this work is able to do. Like you having me on your podcast, you're demonstrating allyship and the people who are making the space to listen and be a little bit more informed than they were before they got here is a demonstration of allyship. When people feel that they have safe spaces that they can go to and share what their challenges are, not just, you know, and herpes is an example. We can interchangeably use herpes for any life challenge or adversity. And this can be an opportunity to really connect with someone one and to support uh, one another. As far a story of someone navigating stigma on my podcast, like the most extreme, um, what comes to mind right now, since we spoke about um, like suicide, um, I think that there was a um, there was one of the guests that I had a long time ago, and it was a black woman. 
and she was sharing her experience with her husband who ended up having HIV and he got a spider bite. It was this spider bite. Now, HIV is not what took him out. He had HIV, immune systems lowered, spider bite comes in and then he goes to the hospital. They don't know what's wrong with him until it was beyond saving. So it was when she began to look through his journals because he's at the point of passing. So she's like looking through his stuff and come to find out he had disclosed to his pastor that he tested positive for HIV. And his pastor was like, nope, just pray it away. Don't tell anybody about this, oh, not God. even your wife. And so she found this information out. And by the time that like, she couldn't even confront him, she just like whispered to him while he was in the coma, I forgive you. He ended up passing away. But like, this is the kind of like, this is probably one of the more powerful stories. And while it's not herpes related, it just speaks to shame and stigma, you know, not just within communities, but from authority figures. Like this was a non-medical professional who was giving medical advice to someone saying, no, don't get treatment, pray it away. God to take care of you. Now, don't get me wrong. He lived for a long time with HIV um, going untreated, but it was that spider bite on his leg that just wouldn't go away. It went untreated. And that's what took him out. So now his this widow is alive to tell his story in that way. So um, that's just a story that comes to mind right now, because if we had better allies, if we had more information and he should have been told, all right, hey, we got this medication out now. Go get go and get on it. Um, U equals U, undetectable equals untransmittable. Um, I know we shifted from HSV to HIV. I don't want to confuse. No, people, I think but... it's it's equally as important to discuss though when we're talking about destigmatizing STIs. I think HIV is the other major major one that people like are understanding is in the same boat. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I, I keep referencing your podcast with uh, Reverend Pleasure because a, a lot of what uh, was said there really resonates with me and like how the priority in this interaction between the pastor and the guy with HIV was about not being perceived as gay. Like this was a matter of combating mm. homosexuality, right? Because HIV was at that point in time, a gay disease. And that was the way that it was approached and look at what happened. So we, we gotta, we gotta see like, the bigger picture, these minor stories, these small stories. I don't want to, I did not know why I said minor, these small stories that we would otherwise never hear, being able to give them uh, space for people to be able to maybe connect with and have a reference point for if something that normally would be met with stigma and shame can be met with compassion and grace and some sort of just empathy and a new framework of approaching whatever the dialogue is, then that's where that allyship comes in. That's what makes people more comfortable and confident disclosing their status. And that's what encourages us to get tested and be aware of our own status. And then we can have a much more of an anti-stigmatic approach to not just STIs, but sex, sexual health communication in general. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you're listening um, and if you want to fight STI stigma in your own lives and if you want to engage in advoca advocacy efforts, it starts with allyship and really like taking that and being a genuine supporter of people who have, uh, whether that be HIV or herpes or other STIs, and just understanding that it is part of health and we don't make fun of people when they have a sore throat and when they need to get the the antibiotics that they need and it's the same thing for STIs and so i think like it it definitely starts there um and i would love to know as our last question where can people find you and support the cause to destigmatize and normalize STIs did you just do that on purpose? I feel like that should be a hook for a song. Destigmatize oh, and normalize. And normalize? Oh, that's good. That's, <laughs> oh, I did not. I did not. You know, I, you know, back to 8 Mile, that should really be in one of their rap battles. <laughs> Maybe uh, in the remake. Maybe they'll do a remake. 
we can do it a 16 mile or something. Oh, wow. That was bad. Fantastic. Okay. So um, <laughs> I am Courtney Brain. I can be found through, well, the organization is Something Positive for Positive People, uh, spfpp.org. You can listen to the podcast, Something Positive for Positive People, wherever you listen to podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio, wherever. And then on the site directly, because that's where I put the podcast episodes. Um, if you want to donate, remember it is a five. 1C3 nonprofit organization that essentially serves as a suicide prevention resource for people navigating herpes stigma. And um, I'm on social media, primarily Instagram at H on my chest. I did just make a TikTok. I caved and it's Wonderful. H, H underscore my underscore chest because for some reason h on my chest was taken i don't know what that was about and it's a very like specific thing whoever has it hasn't posted or done anything with it so it's just like chilling there so i had to put underscores who knows Uh, right they want me to buy it from them nope (laughs) (laughs) so um yeah but that's it i mean I encourage people to listen to the podcast. It's a great resource for uh, referring people to uh, if they are struggling with herpes stigma or if you're someone who wants to date someone who has herpes. It's a great resource to just kind of hear from people who have their own lived experiences and you can see what that's like because we just don't have that kind of information out there. Incredible. Courtney, thank you so, so much for being on. This has been a true blast. And I'm really, really appreciative of your work. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you. In a world that constantly encourages you to change, it's bold to just be yourself. Sexual expression and satisfaction are different for everybody. So rather than conforming to others, focus on falling in love with who you are. Lion's Den sources the very best products to help you find what you like and help you feel confident expressing your sexual desires. You can get 15% off in-store and online using code SEXEDWITHDB to begin exploring everything about yourself. Follow Lion's Den on social at Lion's Den Adult on Instagram and TikTok. Let me tell you about an amazing educated course about the female orgasm. In this course, you'll learn how to touch the different pleasure zones of the vulva, expand your experience of pleasure and orgasmic potential, get new techniques for achieving multiple orgasms, and learn about sex toys for exploring new ways to orgasm. Beducated's content is super easy to follow and inclusive with a community of sex-positive experts leading the way. Level up your love life and join Beducated from just $7.99 per month with a 24-hour free trial using my coupon code SEXED at Beducated.com. Seven years ago, I was gifted my first ever vibrator. It was a rabbit vibe and I was immediately in love with it and the pleasure it gave me. Having a bit of experience with Rabbit Vibes over the last seven years, I am absolutely stoked to tell you about an amazing one from Fun Factory. Miss Buy from Fun Factory is the dual vibrator you've been dreaming of, with a powerful German-engineered motor that gives you super strong vibrations. Follow Fun Factory on IG at Fun Factory USA and use code SEXED with DB for 15% off your new favorite German Rabbit Vibe. Our creator, host, EP, and sound engineer is me, Danielle Bezalel, aka DB. Our co-producer and communications lead is Catherine Cohen. Our music theme is by Hook Sounds, and our ad music is by my stepdad, Bill Gant. Thank you so much to our featured guests, partners, and our listeners. Want to advertise with us? Email us at sexedwithdb at gmail.com. For more sex ed content, Follow us on IG at Sex Ed with DB Podcast and on TikTok at Sex Ed with DB. See you next time. <laughs>